Do you believe I'd drag you here in the middle of a war to discuss a rumor? I think anyone can be wrong, even an emperor. I had forgotten how insolent you can be. His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Emir Va Emris, Deathwin Adan Incan Ep Morvut, the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies. The northern realms look upon him as a tyrant and an autocrat who enforces obedience with whip, noose, and axe. The southern lands praise him as the voice of reason and enlightenment, who will bring peace and culture to the barbaric Nordlings. He was well known for his lack of patience, stating obvious facts, attempting to keep secrets, showing insincerity or indecisiveness, or implying that he can't do something in his presence, was liable to get one thrown into a Nilfgaardian dungeon. And cruel though his reputation might be, Emir did not in fact enjoy violent executions. But he didn't garner such infamy until later in life, of course. Where did he start, then? Well, let's start at the beginning. During Emir's younger years, his father, Fergus Va Emris, was overthrown by a group of rebels, meaning to usurp the throne. However, Fergus would not bend to the usurper's demand that he grant legitimacy to their coup. In an effort to persuade the old emperor, they took his only son, Emir, and threatened to cast a terrible curse on him if Fergus did not cooperate, but still he did not break. And so, young Emir was cursed to look like a monster. The mage responsible apparently had a sense of humor, too. Emir in Nilfgaardian means hedgehog, and so he turned the boy into just that beast, or rather a monstrous version of it. Still, Emir's father did not break, so in the end, he was killed, and Emir, hounded by mockery and insults, fled into the forest while chased by dogs. However, they didn't quite chase him far enough, or they would have realized that the mage had botched the curse. From midnight until dawn, Emir returned to his human form. He was only 13 years old at the time, and after consulting an astrologer by the name of Sarthisius, Emir fled the country to the north, past the Marnadal steppes. As Sarthisius had told him, that's where he would find a way to break this curse of his. Wandering the world for some time, Emir grew older and stronger until he eventually ran across an unfortunate soul, stuck in a ravine surrounded by wild animals. The man in question was none other than Rugner of Ebbing, husband to Kalantha of Sintra and soon to be father of Pavetta of Sintra. Emir saved the king and when asked what he wished for in return, Emir invoked the law of surprise, convinced that this would break his curse. Rugner agreed and upon arriving home, he found Kalantha in labor, giving birth to Pavetta, Pavetta of Sintra, who now belonged to Emir Va Emris of Nilfgaard. In 15 years, Emir would return to claim his reward. However, before those 15 years were over, Rugner had died and Kalantha learned of the reward granted to a stranger in the forest. She learned that her young daughter was to be given to some vagabond knight with no royal status. She could not let that happen and so, when the 15 years had passed, Kalantha organized a feast for potential suitors for her little Pavetta. She also invited a certain witcher, of course, Geralt of Rivia. She would not leave anything to chance. If her plan didn't work, she'd ask Geralt to kill Amir. And surely, close to midnight, Amir showed himself. Clad from head to toe in spiked black and blue armor of iron and leather, and wearing a helmet shaped in the form of a hound's muzzle. He introduced himself, not as Emir of Nilfgaard, of course, but instead as Urchin of Erlenwold. The table of suitors was confused, to say the least, but Kalantha offered him a place at the table nonetheless, which he refused. Nor would he remove his helmet when requested, pretending that he could not due to a knightly vow. He could only remove his helmet after midnight. He told those gathered the story of Rugner and the Law of Surprise. He told them he'd come to collect. This entire story earned him some very snide remarks from Kalantha, 
but this did not deter Emir. He came to marry Pavetta and he would not leave without her. The table, filled with hopeful suitors, erupted in anger, but after some back and forth, Kalantha had to confirm the truth of Emir's story and decided to convene the next day to discuss the issue properly. However, it would not come to that, as Geralt spoke up. He realized that Emir did not come to take power away from Kalantha. He didn't want Sintra. He didn't want a kingdom. He truly only wanted Pavetta. But Geralt, as something of an expert on the law of surprise, stated that the law would only apply if the object of his destiny agreed to leave with the knight. In other words, if Pavetta didn't want to leave with him, the law would be void. That was how destiny worked. After Geralt's little speech, the midnight bell tolled. Or at least it seemed to. This was not truly the midnight bell. It was, in fact, one minute to midnight. Kalantha, who was fully aware that Amir was cursed, had set a final trap for him to keep him from taking Pavetta. As it was now presumably midnight, Kalantha requested once more he remove his helmet. And so he did. But as midnight hadn't truly struck, he was still a monstrous hedgehog. Thinking she had won, Kalantha now asked Pavetta to tell him whether she would leave with him, and to her mother's utter surprise, Pavetta agreed to leave with the hedgehog. Amir, vindicated, asked to leave with her immediately. Instead, Kalantha collapsed and for a moment, chaos ensued as swords were drawn and guards called. From the very start of the banquet, Geralt and Mausak, the druid, had felt a strange energy gather in the room. Pavetta's elder blood energy was building. And as she saw Amir lose his battle with the guards, it now exploded in full force. She floated in the air, screaming, destroying everything around her in a blind frenzy of pure emotion. Nothing seemed capable of stopping her, except the horrible sounds coming from the bagpipes brought along by the Skellige Bard, Dragbondu. Said bard was being strangled with said bagpipes, and it produced such a horrifying sound that Pavetta fell silent for a moment. Mausak and Geralt took the opportunity to hit her with a spell simultaneously, which put an end to the whole affair. Pavetta fell to the ground, weeping, but after a moment she stood up and staggered towards Amir, who was sitting against the wall in blood-smeared armor. Midnight had now finally come, and his transformation had started. He was slowly turning back into his human self. Afterwards, in a private chamber, Amir explained everything. Though he actually lied about everything instead. He couldn't rightly tell them he was the rightful heir to the throne of Nilfgaard, so instead he told them that his name was Juni, son of Akerspark of Maked. And he had no idea how he was ever cursed in the first place. His father had tried to hide the curse, and so he was taken from court and raised by a knight. When he encountered Rugner, he hoped the child's surprise law would free him from the curse. After this list of lies, Kalantha also noticed that, child surprise or no, Amir had not waited 15 years to come back for his reward. He had come back well before that and gotten Pavetta pregnant at only 14 years old, though none of them knew about the pregnancy at the time. But as Amir was very convincingly pretending to love Pavetta, Kalantha relented and agreed to let them marry. Not necessarily for Amir and Pavetta's sake, but so she could remain queen of Sintra a little while longer. As they talked, the clock ticked on mercilessly, and before they knew it, dawn broke. Amir, however, remained a human. The curse had been broken. Not by Pavetta, not by the child's surprise law, but by Kalantha. When she willingly gave Pavetta to Amir, the magic ended. Now, after all was said and done, Amir could not help but ask Geralt, what reward he would have for saving his life? You see, during the chaos in the throne room, Geralt saved Emir's life several times, from other guests and guards. Geralt wouldn't hear of it, but Emir, of course, is very stubborn. 
I still say I am in your debt, Witcher. It is my life that Rainforn's dagger endangered. I would have been beaten to death by the guards without you. If there's talk of a price, then I should be the one to pay. I assure you, I can afford it. What do you ask, Geralt? Uh, Junie, said Geralt, slowly. A Witcher who is asked such a question has to ask to have it repeated. I repeat, therefore, because you see, I am in your debt for still another reason. When I found out who you were, there in the hall, I hated you and thought very badly of you. I took you for a blind, bloodthirsty tool, for someone who kills coldly and without question, who wipes his blade clean of blood and counts the cash. But I've become convinced that the Witcher's profession is worthy of respect. You protect us not only from the evil lurking in the darkness, but also from that which lies within ourselves. It's a shame there are so few of you." Calantha smiled. For the first time that night, Geralt was inclined to believe it was genuine. My son-in-law has spoken well. I have to add two words to what he said. Precisely two. Forgive, Geralt. And I, said Junie, ask again. What do you ask for? Junie, said Geralt seriously. Kalantha, Pavetta, and you, righteous Knight Yusach, future king of Sintra. In order to become a witcher, you have to be born in the shadow of destiny, and very few are born like that. That's why there are so few of us. We're growing old, dying. Without anyone to pass our knowledge, our gifts onto, we lack successors. And this world is full of evil, which waits for the day none of us are left. Geralt? whispered Kalantha. Yes, you're not wrong, Queen. Junie, you will give me that which you already have, but do not know. I'll return to Sintra in six years to see if destiny has been kind to me. Pavetta! Junie opened his eyes wide. Surely you're not! Pavetta! exclaimed Kalantha. Are you... are you... The princess lowered her eyes and blushed, and then replied. Pavetta, of course was already pregnant with Ciri, and Ciri, Amir's daughter, was now promised to the Witcher, Geralt of Rivia. Warm welcome. Thank you, your majesty. You should have come with my daughter. Your welcome would have been different. After the night of the banquet, Amir and Pavetta then spent their time together quite happily for a while spending a great deal of time on the Skelliger Isles. But not long after Ciri's birth, the sorcerer Vilgefortz visited Amir, secretly, of course. He introduced himself as a confidant of those who remained faithful to the Var Emrys line in Nilfgaard, and offered his help. When asked what he wanted in return for this help, Vilgefortz lied and told him he merely wanted wealth and power once Amir became emperor. At this point, Vilgefortz showed Emir the prophecy of Ithlin. Most are familiar with the prophecy by now. It talks of the savior carrying the elder blood. However, the prophecy itself was constantly explained in different ways. When Geralt eventually sits down to talk to Emir about exactly this, the emperor tells us that Vilgefortz explained it to him as such. Cyrilla, continued the emperor, will be happy. Like most of the queens I was talking about, it will come with time. Cyrilla will transfer the love that I do not demand at all onto a son I will beget with her, an archduke, and later an emperor. An emperor who will beget a son, a son who will be the ruler of the world, and will save the world from destruction. Thus speaks the prophecy, whose exact contents only I know. Fabrication or truth, it didn't matter. Amir believed it and wished for the savior of the world to be born into the Va Emrys line, the imperial dynasty. And so, daughter or no, he was determined to marry Cyrilla of Sintra and have her bear his children. With this in mind, he took Vilgefortz up on his offer of cooperation. Meanwhile, in Nilfgaard, Amir's cause was gaining more and more support, as the rightful heir to the throne and imperial crown, he was to be the flag of the revolution. Many had hoped that was all he would be, of course. 
a flag for them to use on their path to power. Had they known Amir, they'd realize this would never be the case. But at this stage, he was still pretending to be Juni, Prince of Maked and False Prince of Sintra. Somehow, he had to become Emir Va Emris once again. However, he needed Ciri by his side to fulfill the prophecy. Easier said than done. Kalantha, Ciri's grandmother, was very, very cautious with Emir and never truly trusted him. So, Vilgefortz came up with a plan. Juni, Pavetta, and their child were to die, disappear without a trace. To accomplish this, they would fake a sinking ship while sailing from Skellige to Sintra. The sorcerer used magic to pull their ship to the Sedna Abyss, where he planned to pull them into a maelstrom. Emir, Pavetta, and Ciri would survive as the crew died, but no one would know of their survival. Or at least that was the plan, but the two conspirators severely underestimated the quiet, shy Pavetta. She had already realized that something was quite wrong, and before they set off on their voyage, she'd smuggled Ciri back onto the mainland of Skellige. When Amir found out, they argued and fought, and in the ensuing scuffle, Pavetta fell overboard. Amir tried to jump after her, but Vilgefortz had already pulled them into the maelstrom, and Amir hit his head during the chaos, knocking him out cold. He survived only because he got caught in the rigging of the ship. When he tells this story to Geralt later, he confesses that while he never loved Pavetta, he still felt worse than a mangy dog over her death. Geralt doesn't quite believe that, though, and he may very well have a point. If Pavetta had lived, Amir would likely have been forced to kill her regardless. She would never have allowed him to use Ciri the way he intended. Regardless, after the disaster, Amir retook the throne from the usurper in a bloody rebellion. He found the mage that cursed him and burned him alive, showing the man that Amir too had a good sense of humor. The mage's name was Brathens, which meant fried in Nilfgaardian. After pounding the gravestones of his enemies into the ballroom, earning him his later infamous name, he once more set his eyes on the horizon. Kalantha, at this point, guarded Ciri like a lioness befits, but Amir still wanted to get his hands on his daughter. He didn't want to kidnap her, however, and Vilgefortz and him were not quite on speaking terms any longer. He still hated every other sorcerer after his childhood, so what was he to do? The solution became quite a simple one, actually, as the military and aristocracy pushed Amir to go to war, to attack Sintra. It was to be his test as a new emperor. He decided he would kill two birds with one stone, take Sintra and Ciri at the same time. And though it was often said that Amir was against the First Northern Nilfgaardian War and that the attack on Sintra was the work of a party hostile to him, having heard the truth from Amir himself, we know this to be pure Nilfgaardian propaganda. Amir most certainly wanted this attack to take place, the rest of the war simply didn't turn out quite the way he'd hoped. While initial war efforts proceeded well, and Sintra was indeed burned to the ground, Ciri was nowhere to be found, and Nilfgaard was eventually beaten back during the Battle of Sodden Hill by a united North and the Mage Alliance, ironically led by Vilgefortz. And so, to save face, Amir proclaimed that he had been against the war, Instead blaming his marshals and their insubordination, heads fell and the scaffolds flowed red with blood. He executed eight marshals and several other less significant people. Some natural yet mysterious deaths occurred, and a great many cases of people suddenly choosing to retire. Amir was sweeping clean his army and his court, as the executions paved the way for young, gifted commanders trained by Emir personally, to take the reins. These new commanders proved highly effective, and Emir started planning his next move, his next war. During the first war, he had methodically burned down the land he conquered to deny the North a stable economy after the fighting ended. Now he sent emissaries to the northern lands, 
some to incite the elves against the humans by feeding them phrases like humans to the sea, and some to sway the population to his side. And he was doing a very good job convincing the northerners of how amazing he and Nilfgaard was, as a prophecy had now started spreading regarding him. White chill will come to be, and after it, the white light. And then the world will be reborn through the white flame and the white queen. Again, a slightly altered version of the prophecy of Athlin. Amir waited, patiently, for the North's next move, for he had time when they did not. The Northern rulers convened and decided to set up a mock attack, pretending that Nilfgaard had attacked them so they could attack back without breaking any peace treaties. They'd expected Amir would be distracted immediately, at which point the Sintrians still left from the First War would move to regain Sintra for themselves. They wanted to force Amir to fight on two fronts. There was one problem with that plan, or several, actually. Firstly, Cyrilla of Sintra. Whoever held the child would have Sintra and the army it still held, as the Sintrians would fight for Kalantha's blood. So, both the North and the South needed her. The North wanted her dead, the South wanted to marry her. Now, not just for the prophecy, but for political influence as well. Secondly, Amir was very well aware of the Northern plans. He knew all about the meeting between Vizimir, Foltest, Demavend, Henselt, and Meave, and he was quite certain that those not invited would not be pleased. So he made sure to inform Athane of Sidaris, Erevil of Verdun, Estherat Thyssen of Kovir, Nidamir and the Chapter of Wizards of what they'd missed. This was significant, because the chapter was in large part responsible for winning the North the First War, and this turn of events allowed Emir to sow discord among them. He guessed where the mock attack would take place, correctly, and sent Menno Kohorn there to wait, with a sizable army until such a time that Emir gave the order to attack. In the meantime, his search for Ciri continued, of course. He sent Kahir Ab Kailach on a secret mission to locate the girl, and his agents scoured the realm in search of his daughter, with little result. Unfortunately for Emir, several of the men in his service had switched sides to Vilgefortz. The mage that fed him the prophecy about Ciri was also after the girl, of course, and had no intention of giving her up to Emir. He had meant to use Emir to get to Ciri. Alas, his Imperial Majesty found out about this unfortunate fact too late. After a provocation, the Second War started in earnest at Dol Angra, where Emir's troops were already waiting, well prepared. They marched onward through Edirne, looting and pillaging wherever they went. Still counting Vilgeforts among the Nilfgaardian allies, a bloody battle ensued at Thanet Isle, between Mage, Skoyatel, the Witcher Geralt, and Cahir ap Kailach. Ciri, who was at the time also on the island, escaped and left everyone standing empty-handed. Frustrated, the hunt for Ciri was now on from all sides. Geralt, Yennefer, Cahir, Amir, the Northern Kings, Vilgeforts, no one wasn't looking for her. And now, Vilgeforts was working for himself, not Amir. However, fate would take a strange turn. In his search for Ciri, Geralt hired two detectives, Codringer and Fenn, who, of course, couldn't quite find the girl either. Instead, they had found a very convincing double. A regular peasant girl who looked like Ciri in many ways. They offered to spread the rumor that she was in fact Ciri. She would be caught by one or the other, perhaps killed, and that was that. The real Ciri would be safe, as no one would look for her any longer, but Geralt categorically rejected this idea and left the detective's house. But not long after, Vilgefortz's henchmen, who were trailing Geralt, found the detectives as well, and within their home, the information about the double. After bringing this information to Vilgefortz's attention, the mage decided they would use this to trick Amir. They kidnapped the poor girl and sent her to Amir, pretending that she was in fact Ciri. 
Of course, Amir, being her father after all, was not so easily fooled. He immediately realized that the girl was a pretender. However, he decided to keep up the pretense for the sake of the Empire. He would pretend to love her as he pretended with Pavetta. He very loudly proclaimed that she, Cyrilla of Sintra, came to Nilfgaard seeking a safe haven, and that he would provide exactly that. He would aid her in reclaiming her lands as an ally. During this audience, he gave her some titles of her own and sent her on her way to Darn Rowan with a woman named Stella Congreve, who would turn her into a true princess. This caused quite a bit of commotion and confusion for various reasons. Firstly, the nobles at the Nilfgaardian court were rather upset that Emir had decided to court this young northern barbarian, as they called her, over their noble daughters. And this dismissal of the Nilfgaardian nobility would eventually lead to them conspiring to overthrow Amir. Secondly, it was well known that Amir would only send anyone to Darn Rowan if he wanted to be rid of them, to never see them again, or sometimes to imprison them. But now he'd sent little pretend Ciri to the castle, after having thrown several other women out of his court. Women he previously favoured, like Dervla Trifin Brain, who was his favourite for three years, even though she already had a husband. Amir had also apparently never chosen an ugly woman to court, and he'd courted quite a few. False Ciri was certainly not seen as beautiful by Nilfgaardian standards, not to mention that she was only 14 years old. This wasn't quite going the way Amir had planned. Geralt of Rivia and... Cyrilla Fiona Ellen Rhiannon, Queen of Sintra, Princess of Bruges, and Duchess of Sutton. Heiress to Innes Ard Skellig and Innes Ann Skellig, and Suzerain of Atra and Abiara. Needless to say, after being presented with a fake Siri, Amir was rather furious. He called a meeting after the audience and sent for Stefan Skellen, Vache de Rideau, and Zarthisius, the astrologer that had helped him when he was a child. Amir addressed each of these men in turn. He requested that Sarthisius use a lock of hair from the real Siri to locate her as accurately as possible. He had attempted the same with mages before, but they had all failed him. He'd hoped Sarthisius would prove more useful. He then interrogated Vache about the little false Siri. How did she get here? Who brought her in? And after some of Vache's answers, Emir finally realized that Vilgefortz had in fact betrayed him, and he suspected that Riens, a mage in Vilgefortz's service, and Cahir, who had disappeared at this point, were also working with Vilgefortz. And so he sent Vache out to locate Riens and Cahir, then sent Skellen away to form a special task force to find Ciri in the area eventually indicated by Sarthisius. If the astronomer found nothing at all, Skellen's task force was to find Vilgefortz instead and kill him. Amir still expected to find Ciri in the sorcerer's lair, and he knew full well how dangerous Vilgefortz was. In the end, however, nothing went as planned. Sarthisius did in fact locate Ciri correctly, but she was long gone by the time Skellen went to look for her. Vache could not find anyone at all, as Ciri had, in the end, killed Riens and Cahir was traveling with Geralt. Stefan Skellen, unbeknownst to Emir, had already betrayed his emperor too by joining a group of conspirators looking to overthrow him. The men who were scorned by Emir's sudden wish to marry a Nordling over their daughters. The men who wanted a more pliable emperor on the throne, like Morvron Vorhis. This group consisted of, among others, Ardal Abdahi, Joachim de Wet, Berengar Luvarden, and Stefan Skellen. Vache de Rideau was, in fact, also involved already. These men had initially attempted to kill Ciri as well, through Stefan Skellen. However, they now decided that this wouldn't be enough any longer. Emir would have to die. This, Stefan Skellen could help them with. As he now worked with Vilgefortz, who held Yennefer of Vengerberg captive, he offered them their aid. Yennefer, under mind control spells, would enter the palace, kill Emir, then commit suicide. They would spin the tale that Emir cruelly stole her daughter, and that this was the act of a devastated mother. All this, however, 
Amir knew nothing about for the moment. Amir was in fact listening to a report of Vache de Rideau, a report that did not include the capture of Cyrilla of Sintra, but did include the disappearance of Stefan Skellen's department, somehow. Amir snidely called Vache the head of a service that instead of making people disappear without a trace, was surprised with the disappearances. To divert some attention from this particular failure, Vache proposes that Amir simply marry the fake Siri. They would hide her away so no one would ever truly see her face. And once they found the real Siri, they would simply get rid of the imposter discreetly. Amir sternly disagreed with the very idea, and when Vache implies that perhaps the real Siri had already died by Vilgefortz's hands, he earns another furious look from Amir. However, he did still give Vache's words some thought, and leaves to visit Darn Rowan and a little false Siri. As the war had now started to stall somewhat for Nilfgaard, he had to consider marrying this version of Siri for the good of the Empire, for reasons of state. For stability in Sintra and the lands south of the Yaruga, which knew constant rebellions, these rebellions were absolutely ruining Amir's supply lines. And so, he walked the gardens with this little girl. This little girl he might make Empress in the end. Amir was well aware that he was seen as ruthless by most of the world, ruthless and unforgiving, but somehow he genuinely cared for this little girl and wished he wouldn't have to use her in this way. He ought to have forgotten about this girl with the green eyes. This girl did not exist. She was a double, an imitation. She didn't even have a name. She was nobody. The Emperor does not ask for forgiveness, does not demean himself before someone who... Forgive me, he said, and the words were unfamiliar, clung unpleasantly to his lips. I committed an error. Yes, it's true. I'm guilty of what happened to you. I was at fault, but I give you my word that you are in no danger. Nothing ill will befall you. No harm, no discredit, no woe. You needn't be afraid. I'm not. She raised her head and looked him straight in the eyes, contrary to protocol. Amir shuddered, moved by the honesty and trust of her gaze. He immediately stood erect, imperious and repellently supercilious. Ask me for whatever you wish. She looked at him again, and he involuntarily recalled the innumerable occasions when he had so easily bought himself ease of conscience for the harm or pain he'd caused somebody, secretly and reprehensibly pleased that he was paying so little. Ask me for whatever you wish, he repeated. And because he was already wary, his voice suddenly gained in humanity. I'll make your every wish come true. If only she wouldn't look at me, he thought. I can't bear her gaze. Apparently people are afraid to look at me, he thought. So what then am I afraid of? Vache de Rideau can shove his reasons of state. If she asks, I'll have her taken home, where she was snatched from. I'll order her taken there in a golden carriage and six horses. All she need do is ask. But the false Siri wanted nothing more but to stay at Darn Rowan with Lady Stella. She was happy here. Amir couldn't quite understand that, but agreed to her wishes regardless. And so, Amir eventually announced his betrothal to the little pretender Siri. He used the marriage and its implications to soothe the lands south of the Yaruga by announcing a nationwide amnesty to all criminals who came forward and confessed. This wasn't so much generosity as it was a clever ploy to add more soldiers to his army as he forced these criminals to enlist instead. Because of course, meanwhile, the war continued as planned. Amir took Adern and signed a pact of neutrality with Foltest of Temeria and Henselt of Kedwin. Through this pact, Nilfgaard could reposition and secretly gain the support of Ervil of Verdun. This was easy enough to conceal, as Fultest and Henselt were happily hunting Scoyatel, which Amir used as bait while he worked. As winter passed, the war effort moved forward in spring. Three army groups were set to thoroughly destroy Temeria. From the east, Ardal Abdahi would lead an army inland. From the west, Joachim de Wet would move through Verdun. And the central group, led by Menno Kohorn, would attack in a straight line. However, two of these groups were, of course, led by conspirators, and Joachim de Wet was not keen to follow the Emperor's plans. 
Instead, he went off on his own, fighting the small Verdun resistance. At least, it started out small. After the many atrocities committed by the Wet's soldiers, the resistance quickly grew into a proper army. Verdun had, up until then, been under Nilfgaardian control, by the grace of Ervil. Now, however, Ervil's son Kistrin killed his father and took control, crushing De Wet underfoot. This complete failure slowed the Central Army group down and boosted the Northerners' morale substantially. De Wet's actions, the betrayer, were likely the reason Nilfgaard lost the war in the end. Regardless, Amir had other things on his mind at the time of the Battle of Brenna. He had left for Stiga Castle, where Vilgefortz hid. There, he found a great many corpses, and in the center of it all, Geralt, Yennefer, and finally, Ciri. Realizing that Ciri was only left alive thanks to Geralt, he offered to explain everything that truly happened to him in private. However, after their short talk, he told the Witcher that Ciri must never know that Emir was truly her father. And in order to do that, both Geralt and Yennefer would have to die. Though Yennefer didn't know the truth, Emir knew full well that she would fight tooth and nail to avenge Geralt and save Ciri. So he saw no other options. Geralt and Yennefer calmly accepted their fate, but Ciri didn't quite agree. I don't understand, Ciri hissed like an infuriated cat. I don't understand why I have to go with him. Where to? What for? Daughter, Yennefer said softly. This and no other is your destiny. Understand that it simply can't be otherwise. And you? Our destiny awaits us. Yennefer looked at Geralt. This is the way it has to be. Come here, my daughter. Hug me tightly. They want to murder you, don't they? I don't agree. I've only just got you back. It's not fair. He who lives by the sword, Emir of Emrys said softly, dies by the sword. They fought against me and lost, but they lost with dignity. Ciri was standing before him in three strides, and Geralt silently sucked in air. He heard Yennefer's gasp. Damn it, he thought. Everybody can see it. All his black uniformed army can see what can't be hidden. The same posture, the same sparkling eyes, the same grimace. Arms crossed on the chest identically. Fortunately, extremely fortunately, she inherited her ashen hair from her mother. But anyhow, when you scrutinize them, it's clear whose blood she is. Ciri then proceeded to scold Amir to no end, as Amir's officers whispered around them. He silenced their whispers with one gesture, and in the end, Ciri was forced to go with him, while Geralt and Yennefer left to have one final bath together, then die. Amir granted them all the time in the world to do so, but it would be done. Amir va Emrys, Imperator of Nilfgaard, accompanied Yennefer and Geralt all the way to the bathroom almost to the edge of a large marble pool full of steaming, fragrant water. Farewell, he said. You don't have to hurry. I'm going, but I'm leaving people here who I shall instruct and to whom I shall issue orders. When you're ready, just call, and a lieutenant will give you a knife. But I repeat, you don't have to hurry. We appreciate your favor, Yennefer nodded gravely. Your Imperial Majesty. Yes. Please, as far as possible, don't harm my daughter. I wouldn't want to die with the thought that she's crying. Emir was silent for a long time, a very long time, leaning against the window with his head turned away. Madame Yennefer, he finally answered, and his face was very strange. You may be certain I shall not harm your and Witcher Geralt's daughter. I've trampled human bodies and danced on the barrows of my foes, and I thought I was capable of anything. But what you suspect me of, I simply wouldn't be capable of doing. I know it now. So I thank you both. Farewell. However, when Geralt and Ciri were quite ready and called out for the officers, no one came but Ciri. As it turns out, Ciri at first had tried to appear completely fine, proud, head held high and her face impassive. But then she began to look back, and slowly but surely, she realized that she would never see Geralt and Yennefer again. Her mask fell and she began to cry. The soldiers were amazed. She had seemed so strong. She tried to stay strong, but only cried louder in desperation. Amirva Emrys stopped, approached Ciri and watched for a while. Then, without a word, 
He reached for her. Siri, who would usually recoil when anyone tried such a thing, did not do so this time. To her surprise as well. Amir hugged her, stroking the back of her head, and finally said goodbye. Va fail, Lunette. He left Siri at Stiga Castle and returned to Nilfgaard, empty-handed. Siri, at this point, had an idea of who Amir truly was to her. It no longer mattered to him. He married the false Siri, whom he truly tried to love and whom he certainly cared for. And they lived a life of relative peace, them and Stella Congreve, the woman who had now become much of a mother to the girl. The Second War ended and a precarious time of peace started. The North was in economic shambles after Emir burned down and stole most everything in Adern. The Scoia'tael leaders were sacrificed for the peace treaty, Emir's marriage to Fol Siri gained him peace in Sintra and the southern lands of the Yaruga. Berengar Luvarden sold out his fellow conspirators, who were put to the sword by Emir, and Joachim de Wet, though also a conspirator, was killed for royally screwing up the war effort, of course. All's well that ends well. And this is where the books end. But Emir's story still continues. During the event of The Witcher 1, Nilfgaard is silent for the most part until the very end, when a Viper School assassin is sent to kill Foltest of Temeria. Geralt stops this assassination, but unfortunately not for long. When The Witcher 2 opens, it is clear that Foltest was dead. Killed by a second Viper School Witcher, Letho of Gullet. Letho and his Viper friends were sent by Emir to kill as many northern monarchs as they could, to destabilize the north. This, in turn, would allow Emir to attack a weakened north, plunged in chaos, divided. Letho managed to kill only two kings, Demavend of Edirn and Foltest of Temeria. This, while it wasn't nearly enough in Emir's eyes, would have to do. After the events at Loch Muin, Nilfgaard's armies once more crossed the Yaruga, and the Third War was upon us. With the north so disorganized, Emir easily seized a great deal of the southern lands, including the Zima, Temeria's capital. However, simply taking the north wasn't the extent of Emir's ambitions now. His daughter, Cyrilla, had shown her face again, and the Emperor was determined to find her. This time, not to marry her, but to put her on the imperial throne. As we see neither hair nor hide of the false Siri, we can only imagine that she went to live at Darn Rowan once more, in hiding. What he told the courts about the real Cyrilla when she finally showed her face, and he called her daughter in front of the nobles gathered, we can only guess. Perhaps he simply didn't care any longer. He had sent Geralt to find Siri, aiding him in every way he could along the way. And now he offered her the crown. Whether she takes it or not is entirely up to the player, of course. However, we needn't look to the games for a proper ending. The books tell us that Emir reigned peacefully for a time before his death, after which Morvran Vorhis took the reins. We can assume, therefore, that Ciri chose to become a witcher instead, perhaps after meeting her father and visiting Nilfgaard, deciding against taking the throne after all, instead joining her true father on the witcher's path. And Amir lived out his days with his false Siri, whom he had grown to love over the years, content to know that his daughter was quite safe indeed. Did she ask you to convey anything? She regretted not getting a chance to say goodbye. Did she tell you this? Really? Didn't have to. She wanted to make peace. I know that. If there's nothing else... There is, but you may go. Witcher! I do not wish to see you ever again. <laughs>